uh, issues that need to be tackled. Now, we have about an hour left, and I would like to ask speakers whether they are on the side of the committee or the side of the delegation to be as brief as possible. You have the floor. A head of delegation, you have the floor. Well, thank you once again. So I will be uh, as brief and fast as possible. One committee member talked about the restructuring of the Ministry of Health and the General Directorate of Family Planning was closed and maternal and child health services and centers were closed. Why was the question? But actually, they, these centers are not closed. In many uh, countries, Public health is the name that is uh, given to the services to combat uh, communicable and non-communicable uh, health uh, problems. So we brought different services together under a single roof, and mother and child health is a part of this institution. It's not close, but it's uh, now under a different institution. And the community health centers serving uh, the society in the field are continuing their services, their activities in a more integrated and more efficient manner. So there is, there sh there is no taking a step, ba step back in this issue. Uh, we just had uh, an integration uh, or a restructuring effort that took place. Another thing I would like to uh, talk about is the use of electroshock in some health institutions and how this was tracked or monitored. What is the mechanism was the question. I have to say that electroshock uh, practice is totally banned totally prevented by no means this can be possible if the members of the committee know or heard about a specific case we are more than ready to carry out the necessary investigations and do what it takes we have a health a hotline 184 and through the web you can have access to ministry of health in such cases Apart from this, in our hospitals, we have patient rights units. We carry out uh, monitoring activities through the media, through the politicians. And furthermore, we have uh, specific field coordinators that are working out in the field who monitor how things are going out in the field and directly report to the ministry. We have a group of about 30 people, uh, one coordinator in each region almost. So we are carrying out these monitoring uh, activities with all these mechanisms. But if there is something that we are missing, when informed, we would uh, do what it takes as soon as possible. And we also have an inspection mechanism through which we investigate uh, such cases if they occur. In terms of child abuse, you ask for some more detailed information and the child tracking or monitoring centers and their structure was asked. These centers, child monitoring centers, are the centers which work despite all the preventive, all the protective uh, measures. If there are still children who are abused, despite everything that is done, in order to avoid secondary traumatization of these uh, children who are subject to abuse, and in order to monitor and keep track of these children, uh, these centers are functioning. Relevant experts are working in these uh, monitoring centers. We have now four child monitoring centers. We will be uh, disseminating them to the 29 regions by the end of this year. There is a pediatrician uh, head of the center. We have a psychologist, a child psychiatrist that come as consultants. So we have mirrored uh, rooms uh, to get information from children. Prosecutors of the Republic uh, actually are on duty 24 hours a day in these centers. 
So by no means it's the security officers or law enforcement units that uh, participate in the uh, interrogation or testimony taking, taking of the child. But we have uh, special rooms uh, with mirrors, as I have said, and they can, uh, behind the mirror, hear and see the child. And when necessary, we can have emergency interventions in these centers, and the reports are also prepared in these centers. And what we have seen is that the courts actually welcome these reports so that the courts don't need to take the testimony uh, of the child again. They just use the reports prepared in these special centers. And the Court of Cassation, High Council of Judges and Prosecutors, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of National Education also participated in the preparation of these activities. And Ankara was chosen as the pilot uh, province to start this practice. About 60,000 public uh, personnel were provided with training. So these child monitoring centers, as I have told you, we want to disseminate them as soon as possible. We want to increase the number of these centers. So in cases which we are not able to prevent despite all measures, we want to at least avoid that the children will be traumatized again and, and again. So we want to make sure that these centers work in a more efficient and effective manner. To sum up, I would like to say that the decrease in maternal and infant mortality rates. And as a result of this, in the last 10 years in Turkey, the life expectancy at birth has increased five years. This is the most important health achievement uh, as an indicator that we have. And the most important part of it is because of the fact that maternal mortality and infant mortality rates are reduced. Another indicator is that uh, the citizens are very satisfied and happy with the health services. Together with the security services, health services are the uh, are one of the two uh, public services that the citizens are satisfied with the most. In 2002, satisfaction level was 39%. Now it's uh, increased to 70 or 75% satisfaction rates. So it means that the services are appreciated by our citizens. Thank you. Mr. Chairperson, we are about to conclude health. If there are no more questions, we can proceed with uh, education. I would like to continue answering the questions that were posed in the morning. First question about the rights of the child. What are the information uh, giving activities and to what level these are included in the curriculum at schools? In terms of CRC and in terms of uh, promoting uh, CRC and giving information about CRC, uh, we carry out activities through schools. This is done in two ways. First of all, 9,100,000 euros was allocated to uh, a human uh, rights and democratic citizenship project. It's an EU project started in 2011. Democratic, democratic citizenship and human rights is uh, a course uh, that is given to children at eighth grade. This includes human rights. This includes freedom of uh, association and assembly. And apart from this, in our programs, we have uh, citizenship and human rights modules. We have 58 chapters in, under different disciplines from first to fifth grade, and some of them include uh, children's rights as well, so that children will learn their rights. For instance, fifth grade social uh, sciences course teaches you the rights of the child and under this course uh, the textbooks uh, include all the articles of the CRC. We oui, uh, 
une question de suivi sur well let's say follow up question on the teaching of human rights human rights uh, teaching our committee two or three years ago in 2009 in fact during the review of Turkey's report under the optional protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflicts had said, and I quote, education in human rights and education for peace are insufficient in the curricula. So my question is, have you taken measures in the meantime to strengthen education in human rights or about human rights and especially to provide an education for peace and to assist uh, those who uh, need to integrate this into the curricula of the schools as had been suggested. Now that has to do with education, but uh, teaching. But since we're on this subject, I'd like to also know whether any measures have been taken to limit the uh, discrepancy or gap between children, between men, uh, between girls and boys. The Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women pointed out that in spite of an enormous amount of effort that has uh, been done, girls had less access to education. 66% is a figure. 66% only of girls can reach uh, secondary education, whereas it's 77% for boys. Have any efforts been made to improve the rate of uh, female children who can go uh, up to and beyond secondary education? Thank you. Thank you. I just mentioned this course on democratic citizenship and human rights. This is a, a facultative uh, course for eight graders, uh, but start uh, it started this year. But starting from next year, this will be a compulsory course. Apart from this, for teachers, in terms of preventing violence and crime, we have formative courses. We have actually organized 22 seminars and. More than 1,000 teachers received these uh, seminars. In terms of girls' education, with the new system 4 plus 4 plus 4, until the end of 12th grade, boys and girls, all uh, students, uh, will continue their education in the secondary uh, education level because it's going to be compulsory for everyone, boys and girls. So as this education for 12 years will be compulsory, there will be no uh, disparity between girls and boys in terms of secondary education. They will, Girls will also receive the same level of education as boys. And despite the fact that this is made compulsory, if parents still don't send their children or daughters to school, they will be faced with sanctions monetary sanctions and other sanctions will be imposed. And girls' schooling rate is 97.3% for primary education. Our target was 100% and by 2014 we will be uh, very close to this. And for secondary education we are higher than 65%. Uh, it used to be 65% but uh, 70% for preschool. I'm talking about preschool, but we are going to revise our goals because with the new system, the starting to school, the age of starting to school will uh, be one year earlier. So all the preschool students will continue 100% uh, to primary school. So 36 to 60 months is the target that we have. So gradually we will be increasing the percentage of preschool uh, students. We have mobile uh, kindergartens or preschool uh, institutions that provide education to children in disadvantaged areas. We also have the preschool strengthening uh, project carried out together with UNICEF. 16.8 euros is allocated to this project. 16.8 million euros. So the representative of UNICEF is also here. We uh, talked to them a couple uh, of weeks ago. So we have promotion activities in our country for preschool. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the efforts being made in, in education are really uh, remarkable. The concern still remains that even though the aggregate uh, figure of 97% attendance and participation is very high, it, it covers up the disparities. 
some areas may be achieving 100 percent and others may be much much lower so we have asked with respect to disparities in other aspects what extra efforts will be made for those children in rural areas hard to reach areas in the east and so on who, who need some extra support uh, we have heard that uh, if the parents don't send the children to school, they will be penalized with uh, monetary sanctions. But maybe the, the parents are poor, and they will not be able to pay these penalties. So uh, uh, are there other ways, affirmative action ways of uh, ensuring? I know you have the girls go to school uh, program and so on, but uh, we, are, we are just looking for ways in which you can really much more dramatically reduce the disparities because the aggregate figures are interesting but they do not tell us about the disparities thank you şimdi <coughs> Well, we have a project that was started very recently by the Minister of National Education in order to increase girls' schooling. So this is a project for increasing girls' schooling. We are going to start our activities to increase girls' enrollment and schooling. And we also have girls' education campaign that started back in 2002. And when we started in 2002, we had 1,434,000 uh, uh, children who were not enrolled in primary education, although it was compulsory. But we lowered this down to 52,000. So from 7.5% it dropped back to 0.5%. So we had visits to all the houses, to all the parents and families, so we tried to convince them so that they would send their children to school. Yes, you may pose sanctions, but uh, giving incentives uh, is uh, a better way. For instance, we have conditional uh, in, uh, incentive programs Maybe our colleagues can give you further information. We also have this busing school and the regional uh, boarding schools, the Yibos as we call them in Turkish. Let me give you the statistics on this in 2002. I'm sorry. Let me start with the scholarships. In 2002, 95,000 people received scholarship. In 2011, this was increased to 234,000. So these children were in need. And in 2012, we are aiming at providing these scholarships to 240,000 students. We were paying lunch uh, and uh, dormitory money. Uh, it was 1.42 Turkish liras a day. It's now increased to 6.5 Turkish liras a day. So it's an increase of 358 percent. And in 1997 and 1998, we started this uh, busing system to transfer children to the schools through buses. If they were living uh, in an area where there was no school, then they would be carried through buses to the closest uh, school. Uh, when we started, we uh, actually helped 281,000 uh, children. Now, in 2011-2012 academic year, we provided this busing service to 722,000 children. And for the Yibos, the regional boarding schools, 59 million US dollars is given for dormitory uh, purposes. And for transportation, 436,000 US dollars is given, and we also provide lunch uh, assistance, 3,000 Turkish liras. And this is uh, actually paid by the social services under the prime ministry. We also uh, try to promote uh, children to participate in compulsory education, and we also provide free of charge textbooks. In 2012, 225 million US dollars worth of uh, free of charge textbooks were distributed from primary education to upper levels of education. Another question was about corporal punishment at school. Do we have a regulation on this? We have three regula regulations actually. 
We have the awards and disciplinary measures regulation of the Ministry of National Education. We have another regulation on the disciplinary sanctions promotion of teachers and the assistance to be provided to the teachers. We have a law on this. And we have a law numbered 1702 for the primary school education and secondary school education and sanctions of teachers. So if teachers physically hit or beat up their students, they will be sanctioned. But even if they don't physically uh, do any punishment, even if they curse or verbally uh, insult children, the students, they will be punished again. We have uh, school councils in 2004. Uh, the Ministry of National Education and the Grand National Assembly of Turkey signed a protocol. And under this protocol, we are teaching our students the culture of democracy, uh, elections and tolerance culture to students. Let me talk about the activities that are carried out in this framework in our schools. Every year there is a certain schedule that is identified. We start with the classrooms and then continue with the school and the district and the province of the school. Follow-up questions on corporal punishment. Yes, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to go back for a second to corporal punishment before we move on to participation in schools. You were saying that there are laws and administrative rules with regard to corporal punishment in the educational sector, but I'd like to understand or I would prefer to have some more concrete information. For example, how many Complaints were received last year, for example, from for cases of corporal punishment either by administrative personnel or teachers. How many were investigated? What was the result of investigation? Because the information we get is that the laws are all there, but they're not necessarily implemented. Perhaps because there isn't that much uh, capacity to inspect or to investigate. So if you could give me the information a little bit more concretely so that I could really understand to what extent those provisions are actually implemented, those provisions with regard to corporal punishment in the schools. Now, we'd also be interested in knowing something about corporal punishment in the home and other areas. And I don't think I've heard an answer on that. Thank you. In our schools, we have an inspection mechanism and the provincial education directorates are responsible to investigate these uh, cases working under the Ministry of National Education. In 2006-2007, we had 3,014 cases, but it went uh, down to 957 in 2011-2012 academic year. We have a Metris Mobile, as we call it. it. You can enter data through the Internet, and we have case uh, uh, management or case analysis forms. And in terms of corporal punishment within family environment, the... The information is the following. According to our relevant regulation of the Ministry of National Education about uh, discipline, if the students are not uh, abiding by the r r rules of school, they can be uh, removed from school on a temporary basis. They can be uh, imposed different sanctions. And uh, by no means a child can be subject to uh, corporal punishment. We have uh, the law number 1702. This also prevents uh, and sanctions corporal punishment. And 
we have the law number 4358, which also uh, brings certain sanctions if teachers are using corporal punishment against students. We also have an action plan that was enacted in 2006 with this action plan. The Ministry of National Education and all relevant institutions have uh, certain duties and roles to play. The action plan is targeting students, teachers and families. And uh, the Ministry of National Education, in terms of preventing risk factors, including violence and bullying at schools, uh, informative counseling services to teachers, families and students are being provided and psychological counseling and guidance is provided to those who are at risk. Another question was about child councils or child parliaments as we call them. We select the children at school level with the participation of schools. Uh, we select uh, a president for the district. With the selection of people from the district, we select a president for the uh, province. And uh, the representatives of the provinces come to the Grand National Assembly of Turkey on a certain day to talk about their opinions regarding children, and they take uh, some resolutions. This year, the meeting was made representing 13 million uh, children. There was a contest to write a composition, an article on uh, democratic uh, society. And the compositions and articles written uh, by the children were also given to the Constitutional Committee, which will be drafting a new constitution at the Parliament. So children's opinions on the new constitution were received. About the complaints mechanism, there was a question. Uh, information uh, can be received through Prime Ministry's communication office and through the hotline 147. It's not only for children or students, even the parents can uh, make complaints through this hotline. Uh, and in three days, we need to uh, give them an answer if it's a question. And if it's a complaint, we need to provide a solution in three days. In terms of training of uh, teachers, uh, there was a question in the morning session. At university level, in terms of training teachers, uh, all the uh, teachers to be receive uh, a course on uh, the rights of the child starting uh, from the moment of conception all the way through the 18 years of age. Psychological, physical, emotional development is taught uh, to teachers at different levels of development. And once they receive this information, they also take a course on special teaching methods uh, about the, the course that they will be teaching, how they can render the children's rights issues in their course, how they can convey the information about the rights of the child in their course. They are informed about all these issues through their education at university. Uh, regional disparities were also uh, emphasized in the questions. Well, removing regional disparity in education is our main priority. Children who cannot go to school because they live in distant places, uh, actually we can send teachers to homes if they don't have a school uh, around, just as in the health uh, system. So 6,600 uh, 6, students are receiving their education, even if they are in uh, hospitals, in 51 hospital schools, they receive this. There was a question about seasonal workers. Our school enrollment system is based on academic attendance. The Ministry of Interior demographic system directly uh, informs our uh, ministry uh, when the child reaches the age of education and is automatically enrolled in the closest school to his home. So we can see from our computer which child is going to start uh, the new academic year in which school. The most important thing is that uh, the child's address uh, is informed to us through the uh, electronic system about seasonal workers. Uh, 
If a person is a seasonal worker and if uh, he or she is bringing uh, his child with uh, him to uh, the region they are migrating to, then uh, if they register their address, the children can uh, continue their education in the new place or they can uh, continue their education by using dormitories in their hometowns. About the guests or refugees, the asylum seekers in Hatay and Kilis, uh, we have teachers who speak Arabic who teach these guests, as we call them. And we have nine schools in this area. 195 administrators and teachers are providing services with six counseling teachers to 4,914 students. And up until now, 3,800,000 thousand US dollars was spent actually maybe this figure is even higher but this is the amount we are informed of there was a question about sexual and reproductory health education in terms of reproductory health at sixth grade we have science and technology training program whereby we teach uh, children uh, about uh, sexual organs and sexual and reproductory system and genital uh, organs and once the child continues secondary education we have health uh, courses fully fledged. We also provide uh, information, philosophical information in the religion and uh, ethics culture uh, courses. We also have programs that are accessible through the internet and so far 230 uh, peer trainers, 115 counselors were trained and through these peer trainers about 4, uh, 9,400 uh, children were trained and we are currently continuing our activities in that regard. For preschool education, as I have mentioned before, we have a support to preschool education project under which we are carrying out our activities and the preschool program was developed. Now with the new 4 plus 4 system, the academics are revising uh, the existing project and we have the 0 to 36 months crash program that is being revisited. In terms of programs, we have no problems or issues at all. For 2011 and 12 academic years, starting from this, uh, 1,100,000 and 69,000 students uh, attended preschool education and our target for the age group between 60 to 72 months, we want to have 100% uh, schooling rate for preschool. And we are carrying out the revision activities, uh, as I have told you. And while trying to uh, encourage uh, children to come to school, we are actually visiting parents. Uh, the families of every children is uh, being visited at least once and sometimes uh, twice. And we have the Mother and Child Education Foundation, Achev as we call it, uh, we have some projects and through these projects uh, parent training activities are carried out and 3 to 6, 6 to 11 years of age, a father support program was provided to 9,770 uh, fathers and in total we have reached 270,000 families. In terms of preschool education, let me give you the budget, budget figures to show you the uh, importance we attach to preschool education. In 2003, we have allocated 22 million to preschool education. We have already a lot of information. Et il reste en tout cas deux chapitres que j'aimerais encore entendre. C'est la justice juvénile où il y a encore des questions supplémentaires. Les questions de, du standard of living, de la pauvreté. The standard of living and the juvenile justice system, I think we need to cover these. So, Mr. Cotton, for the juvenile system, uh, in addition to the questions uh, since this morning on juvenile justice system, we have some concerns. According to the information that we have available with regard to the investigations, when a child commits an offense before even going to trial, there is a difficulty because the number of children in 
custody or remand, and others have been already brought to trial. There were, in 2011, 1,773 children who were in on remand, whereas 258 were on trial while awaiting their appeals, and 207 were already serving their sentences. Children are already placed in this preventive detention, whereas that should be the last resort. That should not be f the case for so many children. They should only be there after their trial and after they have been sentenced. It could be that they're a danger to the community and therefore need to be detained, but that should be the exception. So I would like to know why that is the case. The children's courts are often, the ch they're not throughout the country, so that they're not often able to attend a children's court. There's not sufficient quality in the legal aid for the children. There is very little pay for the lawyers who deal with those children's cases. The length of the judicial proceedings, the average first level court is 414 days for these cases for the children. So they spend an enormous amount of time in detention. They have long sentences. They have very poor conditions. There has been complaints of torture. In the, the Bosanti prison, there are cases of rape and there are children who are held under anti-terrorist laws where their conditions are difficult, especially if they're t held together with adults. Thank you, sir. Well, poverty and juvenile justice, could we hear your replies? Oh, for juvenile justice, there's also Mr. Gaston who had questions. So I don't know if you want to give the floor to the social services they had started or the Ministry of Justice. It's for you to decide. Uh, maybe first poverty issues. Ms. Shebnam will quote some figures about poverty and then I'll give the floor to Ministry of Justice. My name is Shebnam Afsar Kurnas from the Social Services Director General, Department Head of Research and Development. Now, 45 percent of uh, the budget that goes to poverty is allocated for children, mainly for basic education and health services. But together with that, uh, poverty is a multidimensional issue. And in that regard, in order to mitigate the effects of the poverty, we are trying to implement multi-level policy programs. Uh, there had been some questions about Eastern and Southeastern Anatolia. When we look at the conditional cash transfer programs, we do see that 67 percent of the ones that benefit from conditional cash transfer do live in the Eastern and Southeastern Anatolia. Again, in total uh, of the social assistance programs, 45 percent goes to eastern and southeastern Anatolia citizens. We do have an action plan to cope with child poverty, and we're working in cooperation with UNICEF. Concerning the conditional cash transfer program, some questions were raised. Uh, we've studied how conditional cash transfer was implemented in Latin American countries and what had been the final impact in our country, we implement it in a different manner. Conditional cash transfer is not the only instrument that we are using in our country. We uh, have a holistic approach. There are other instruments that we are using together with conditional cash transfer. And we are carrying out some impact assessment studies to assess the results of the conditional cash transfer. Uh, the study was carried out with 196,000 students. We've seen that it decreased in attendance of the children by 50 percent and uh, 80 percent of increase in the schooling of the girls had been achieved and 71 percent of the children who enjoyed conditional cash transfer had regular medical 
care services received. And there was a question about the expansion of uh, this program for preschool education. This is a successful program, and we're planning to uh, expand it to preschool age group as well. Our main purpose uh, the, the, in terms of poverty, uh, poverty struggle uh, 1.38 percent of GDP uh, is now allocated, but our target is to uh, is to increase it up to three percent, and uh, the percentage in the OECD is five uh, percent. And uh, we would like to apply social assistance programs in a holistic manner so that uh, we would be able to receive a real impact. And in the minimum income support, we take into consideration the number of the children in one family so that we will be uh, providing a proportional assistance. And we don't want to see anyone living under $4.3 a day of uh, survival in our country. That's all I want to say. Madam Herzog. Just a very brief uh, question. I'm really happy to hear that you want to extend the CCT program. My only question is, is it uh, <clears throat> conducted in a, in a holistic way that it's not only the, about the cash transfer but also support provided to parents to increase their parenting capacities and uh, other forms of support, or is just the cash what you are providing to them? So what kind of additional information or support is provided non-financial. Uh, meaning holistic, uh, holistic approach. Meaning we do take the other needs of the family into consideration. Basic needs like food, fuel shelter and social assistance oriented uh, approach we have as the director general but together with the social service projects like training programs we do provide uh, support to our target groups thank you madam Morris. i apologize i was satisfied actually with the first part of the explanation about uh, holistic policies. However, now that I've heard the following explanation, I continue to wonder whether the holistic approach is not, for the time being, simply supportive, uh, playing a sort of a supportive role. Now, I don't know whether with the interpretation into English and in Turkish allows you to understand the concept. But what I'm trying to say, and, and this is something that we mentioned this morning, is that combating poverty and combating inequality specifically requires many measures in the form of short-term immediate assistance uh, type measures for people who are under the poverty line, below the poverty line, in particular children and women. But at the same time, simultaneously, it requires a package of policies and programs that are both social and economic, which target the deepest roots, underlying roots of poverty and disequality, inequality. So it's not sufficient for the holistic uh, approach to have to involve uh, subsidies for accommodation and for food if in the long term we are not certain, for example, that women who wish to work or have to work can actually work and who are uh, and are then able to work in a decent uh, circumstances and receive a salary which is equivalent to the salary uh, which is received by by men and that the minimum uh, wage in the country is calculated on the basis of an approach which would involve taking people out of poverty and so on and so forth so in other words when you talk about a holistic program for me that is holistic this is what we understand in the committee on the rights of the child when we talk about standard of living viewed in a holistic way yes 
distinguished member of the committee defined the holistic approach in a very right manner. And we ourselves established Ministry of Family and Social Policies just because of that. Uh, and we have collected everything under a single roof. Uh, the Director General uh, serves for certain works, and uh, the, we do have the relevant units that complements with what you have described. Uh, this uh, family training programs, social services, everything that you have described are being provided. And as I have indicated in my presentation, family social support systems. Uh, this is the most important project of my ministry, so that holistic and um, uh, programs that will stay, that uh, that would always be there in the system will be there. And uh, completely because of the points that you have described, we have went through a restructuralization process. The representative of our Directorate General only described the financial aspect of it because of the time limitation, but we can make a further explanation and a more detailed explanation. We are doing so many things that this time is not enough for us to explain everything, but we can follow it up in the written format if you want. Thank you. I would like to make a very brief contribution, social service and employment connection. Everyone who applies for social assistance uh, are being registered in the employment agency and if they want to participate in a vocational training program, they are uh, they are registered to an employment program as well. And this is the connection uh, that you are asking for. And the member of the committee asked uh, uh, the holistic approach about employment of women and how they're placed in the labor market. In 2008, we have a very important employment package that had been enacted and affirmative action had been taken for young people and for women to be recruited. If an employer recruits a woman or a young person, then the social insurance premium will be paid by the government, not by the employer. This is a very important affirmative action taken by the government. And there has been a significant increase in women's employment after these measures. And as the Ministry of Family and Social Services, one of the most important projects that we're still working on is that mothers who would like to pursue their career ambitions and who would like to have a family uh, would be assisted together with the World Bank, uh, together with the NGOs like Kagidar, we're trying to develop a local model specific to ourselves to support the young population and uh, to enable our women to be involved in economic life and in social life so that we'll be able to strengthen women's position. And after we conclude the study, we will present it to the Council of Ministers and we will be following up the legal infrastructure and its imp implementation. Uh, the um, Minister of Justice at the floor. I would like to start with a brief introduction. In the previous sessions, uh, some I've quoted some figures, and I think there had been some kind of a misunderstanding. Let us try to uh, let us try to make them clarify. The number of arrested is something else. Detainees are something else. Let me uh, the pre-trial detention and custody they are different. Right at the moment, we do have 241 convicted children with fixed punish, uh, sentences. 225 of them are convicted, but still waiting, still pending at the Court of Appeals. 1,736 of them are in pretrial detention. Uh, this is very important. I've told it two times. This is the third time I'm saying these are being prosecuted in juvenile courts with specialized personnel. 
and out of the cases only one, less than one percent of those children are being uh, in pretrial detention it is not even one percent uh, throughout the juvenile courts and this is not a very high figure i suppose again in our legislation uh, pretrial detention is the last resort and in order to minimize uh, this type of detention, we're taking all sorts of measures for the children who are below the age of 15, for the offenses that, uh, would, not, uh, that would not require more than five years of imprisonment, cannot be detained. And no matter what the offense is, I am underlining it, no matter what the offense is, the judge would decide an alternative method to detention. Detention will be the final resort. Judicial control will be used first, then as the last resort, detention comes. Again, in our criminal procedural law, all sorts of advantages, um, options are being chosen for the juveniles and multiple offenses mechanisms are not implemented for juveniles. All sorts of um, the imprisonment less than a year are uh, being, the, if less than two years, then all other options are being used other than imprisonment and also uh, for the uh, offences that would require less than two years of imprisonment are being postponed. And I think it was not clear when we explained what is a training centre. Training centre is the name we give to the prisons for the convicted children. Out of 2,190 children, 1,590 of them are in the training centers. This is what we prefer to call their prisons. Some receive special education, some receive apprenticeship training, some go to the university. So this is the general profile. The majority of those children are getting acquainted with any type of education for the first time. Most of them are the type of children that are living on the streets and forced to work on the streets. And when they come to the prison, as we call them training centers, is the first time that they receive any kind of formal training. Thank you very much for these explanations. But when you tell me that there are 1,770 children who are in pretrial detention, in other words, have not yet been sentenced or prosecuted, I think that you will understand that we find this to be a very high number when compared with the number of children who have been sentenced or prosecuted. Normally, uh, a child should benefit from the presumption of innocence and should not be placed in a pretrial detention situation before the prosecution. They should be released, except for the most serious cases. So this is what we're concerned about, the figures that you have just said. There are more children who are in pretrial detention than children who are in prison, who are incarcerated as detainees as a result of a sentencing. That's the problem, uh, unless I did not understand things. Yes, let me add, Chairman speaking, let me say that if we take one element into account that you mentioned yourselves, the length of the uh, procedures, in other words, these people are probably in a very long, uh, for a very long time in pretrial detention, and that pretrial detention is being used uh, as a way of uh, being able to carry out an investigation. Uh, that's not the purpose of it. There are ten times more young people in well, seven times, seven times more children in pretrial detention than are actually convicted. So there's something here that we just don't understand. Let me try to respond in such a way. We do accept that the prosecution is taking a long time and we need to make an arrangement to ameliorate the situation. Why the prosecution is taking so long is because that uh, 
the necessary spe specialist reports being received in sexual abuse cases are taking a long time and we are working to amend the legislation uh, and the age group that falls underneath this category is between the ages of 12 to 18. This is different. And when uh, the pre-detention, uh, pre-trial detention is prolonged, and if they exceed uh, the age of 18, uh, then, of course, they may be transferred to adult prisons. And if their education is continuing, they can still be kept in the training centers, in the training center prisons. But uh, it is because that the number of the offenses, uh, delinquencies of those children are quite numerous. For example, there are very serious homicide cases among those children. Uh, sometimes uh, there are some children uh, abused by the, uh, used by the terrorist organization. And some of those children uh, have been used in narcotics uh, crimes. For that reason, when those type of of offenses are considered, generally they would require very high uh, sentences. And because they are children, we try to uh, act in a sensitive way. But uh, the uh, court proceedings, uh, prosecution process is taking long and we're trying to improve it. So at this very moment, I would like to talk about a very important project. Uh, our committee member asked the question in a very rightful manner. We have a very important project together with UNICEF, Ministry of Justice, and the Ministry of uh, Family and Social Policies are working at this very uh, topic, it is a very large project of uh, 3.7 million euros, and our main purpose is to prevent those children get into those situations so that they will stay in the system. So the question marks that you have raised would be eliminated, and we will fill up, uh, fill in the infrastructure to avoid those problems. Well, I were very pleased to hear that there is such a project because, in our view, there is a relatively serious problem in juvenile justice in your country. And the gentleman from the Ministry of Justice, when he says that they are in pretrial detention and they're 18 and then they move to an adult prison, uh, prison for adults, that's even worse because they need to be, according to the law, uh, are minors. They should be judged according to the law for minors and not the law for adults. So there's an additional reason you've just given us to be concerned uh, about your system. I would very much appreciate it if you could respond to the last question, conditions of detention, because Mr. Kotrani asked uh, the question when these children are detained. They're detained, of course, for a very long time. We know that now. But what are the conditions? Uh, we need so we have some information about the ill treatment, mistreatment in conditions of detention, also in the specialized center. So, if you could briefly respond, because I will have to close the session and give the floor to the rapporteur and then to uh, the head of delegation. Uh, Those children in no way stay with adults. They stay in a separate physical environment uh, and they're subject to s special prison rules uh, for juveniles. Even among uh, the juveniles, uh, they're physical development and their age groups are taken into consideration while we put them together. This is the current system. Two-thirds of the 2,190 children are staying under those conditions, and the remaining one-third of those uh, children are living in uh, single rooms. They have their own bathrooms, and uh, without their own will and wish, without the consent of the teacher 
or the rehabilitation specialist, no one can enter in uh, their room. And they attend uh, their they attend uh, their daily activities. And at night time, when they want to sleep, they go up to their own room. Uh, are uh, physical conditions now able to accommodate only one third of those children? But in two and a half years' time, all. Uh, detainee children and convicted children will have the same standards when we finish all the projects. And uh, in terms of prosecution, uh, children, juveniles are prosecuted completely in a different way and the adults are prosecuted in a completely different way. Uh, just because that their age grows when they are about 18 years of age, they are moved to adult prison, it has nothing to do with the juvenile prosecution method that they're subject to. They are still subject to juvenile prosecution. I would like to, because their acquired rights will not be lost. Mr. Chairperson, I would like to add a few things as well. As a result of the juvenile uh, prosecution, 80% of the sentences of the court verdicts as a result of juvenile prosecution is something other than imprisonment. Only 20% of the court verdicts are imprisonment and they can be postponed or they can be converted into fines, monetary penalties. And uh, you said that the numbers are very high. Uh, yeah, uh, you need to consider the population of Turkey as well. We have around 75 million of population and we have 9 million children with uh, criminal liability. So, 9 million children with criminal liability, and uh, when you think of the rates and the proportions, the number of the children under pretrial detention is not that high. And in terms of terrorism, as one last point, in July 2010, we had some amendments in our laws, and as a result of those amendments, children are in no way in uh, contact with anti-terror uh, police, anti-terrorism courts or prosecutors. They are now out of the system. Well, I unfortunately have to stop you. I know that you have a lot to say, interesting things to be sure. But unfortunately, we have come to the point where we have to close our meeting. We have two uh, people we will be hearing from. The first one is Mr. Kochani, the rapporteur, who will make a presentation, I think, uh, alone. And then I shall be giving you the floor, uh, head of delegation, Madam. And then we have to close at 1800 hours at 6 p.m. Mr. Kochani, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At the end of a day of discussions and dialogue, I would like Mr. Chairman to express our gratitude to uh, Madam uh, Minister and to this extremely numerous uh, delegation who have accompanied her. I think that our exchanges were could be described as open, varied, constructive, discussions and the we've had the presence here of people with uh, a high level of competence and this has made it possible to enrich the debate we come out of this with the firm belief and conviction that uh, turkey can be proud of its children and what it has actually achieved for children in many areas we feel we understand we, we see we sense the commitment of the, this member state to improve the situation, but especially for the rights of children, because children are the future and the wealth of the country. The commitment of the state is uh, achieved through the very significant uh, amendments uh, to the laws. We talked about the amendments to the various laws, the law against terrorism in 2010, but many other laws, the law on the protection of children. Then there was a law on disabled persons, the Turkish criminal code, the civil code. 
a lot has been done in the area of reform, but also in terms of the means and resources made available to children, uh, whether in the area of education, to make uh, schooling obligatory and to go up to 12 years of uh, mandatory education, which is going to, of course, improve many things. And we're also very grateful for all the information we've been provided with in terms of the resources and means made available by the State Party to promote even more the health system and many other policies. Now, of course, our committee will be issuing recommendations as well. Some of them are recurrent uh, recommendations. For example, our recommendation about reservations to Article 17, 1930 of the Convention. Uh, then there will be recommendations about a better dissemination of the uh, Convention for all professionals who are working with it and the children themselves as well, because that is what will make it possible to see a true and effective implementation of the Convention beyond the principle which is enshrined in the Constitution, which uh, ensures that there is primacy attached to it. We attract your attention to the differences, discrepancies between regions uh, in terms of the enjoyment of the rights uh, for children. We'll also mention some persistent discrimination and the need to ensure better equality between girls and boys, between also the minorities, all minorities, uh, Madam Minister, the Kurds, the Roma, the Arameans. We We'll also mention issues relating to um, corporal punishment, for example. We get the impression that, they, well, they are prohibited uh, in the school, but we would like them to th this to be more effective in school, but also in the family that there should be prohibition of corporal punishment. We will also mention the health uh, system, and some of the recommendations will touch upon uh, the uh, breastfeeding, uh, about sexual and reproductive health, calling on the state to go even further. A lot has been done, but there still are challenges that need to be faced down. We will talk about education, both education in the school, but also education about human rights, about values, and also about the education uh, for minorities in their own languages and in their own culture. We shall also finally be talking, Mr. Chairman, about the situation of certain children who require even more protection children who are asylum seekers, children who are refugee children, child labor, juvenile justice, which we just touched upon, and we will also make some recommendations about the follow-up to our earlier concluding observations that were made when we reviewed the optional protocol to our convention, one relating to the sale of children and prostitution of children, pornography involving children, and the other one relating to the involvement of children in armed conflicts. There are a few uh, issues that we will uh, be dealing with. Of course, we will make all of these recommendations with the intention and the purpose of making these observations, uh, bringing them to the attention of authorities, because uh, we are certain that uh, Turkey places the rights of children at the very highest level of the priorities of the country. So please be assured, Madam Minister, we understand your efforts, we welcome your efforts, but we would like the rights of children to be even more protected and even more promoted for all children in Turkey Finally, I would like you to pass on uh, our, uh, the greetings of the committee to all children in Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kotrani. Madam Minister, you have the floor. You get the last word. Sayın Başkanım, distinguished chairperson, you have a very professional management understanding I would like to thank you for all the participation and support of your committee to our delegation members uh, for all the efforts that you have carried out and for future activities that we will be carrying out with you. I would like to say that I'm grateful to you all in terms of the preparation of child strategy documents as mentioned by our rapporteur the member of committee uh, we need to make sure that the recommendations should no longer stay as recommendations only but uh, that there is a will uh, to actually implement all the recommendations within the framework of the government uh, program in terms of child labor we have a general director coming from the ministry of labor who also would uh, made some uh, explanations uh, but 
there was no time. And in terms of viol uh, violence and fight against violence, we have recently enacted a law. So if a man is uh, using violence, he should be removed from the household, even if despite the removal decision, he uh, can be uh, put into prison. So this law is bringing these new things. I wish we had uh, more time so that we would be able to tell you about all these things in detail, but hopefully we will be giving you all this information in written format. Our colleague from the uh, Turkstat had information to give you. Our colleague from the Ministry of Defense had some information to give you. Uh, when we give them to you in written format, you will be able to uh, actually merge all the information in your mind so that we will be uh, providing you with full responses to all the questions. We want you to believe that the that there is a will, a very strong will at the parliamentary level, at the government level, in order to strengthen the rights of the child and the strategy to internalize the rights of the child, to support ch uh, children's participation. We will be following up on this on personal basis. And for children who are victims, who are abused, and for juvenile offenders, we want to make sure that they become a part of the system. They remain within the system through rehabilitation. So juvenile justice system is very important for us. Once the projects we are carrying out are concluded, I do believe that many of the questions that you have as the members of this committee uh, will be answered. Our aim is to work hand in hand for the world children. We want to bring a better, a more livable, safe and a lovable environment for all the children in the world. We are ready for any type of cooperation and I would like to thank you so much for your participation and support and I would like to extend you my uh, respects and love. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Minister, for your concluding statement, which we uh, appreciate very much. And also, thank you for your commitment uh, over the course of this day. I'd like to thank you and all the members of the delegation. I know that it's a very frustrating exercise. I realize that because we ask you so many questions and we would have so many replies from you. Unfortunately, time is our, not on our side. Uh, there's a lot more you wanted to say. but. This exercise does make it possible for us to uh, do our jobs. And we're very appreciative of all of the information that you have provided, which is good news for children. So it is now my uh, job to uh, adjourn this meeting. I wish you all uh, Godspeed and a good trip back home. And for those of you who remain in Geneva, uh, much luck. And we shall meet at 9.45 on Monday for our preparation of the next country. We shall be reviewing at 10 o'clock. So once again, a good stay in uh, Geneva and a good trip back to Turkey for our Turkish friends. Enjoy the lake. Thank you very much. The meeting stands adjourned.